So here's a, uh, a quick outline of, of what I'm going to try and cover in the next hour or so. Um, so I'm going to give some examples of um, various projects that I've worked with in terms of doing visualization, and some examples of, um, you know, of, of doing this at, at large scale on, on, on large data from, uh, from simu primarily from simulation data. Um, talk a little bit about visual, uh, HPC Viz resources. Um, and then go, then dive into more um, some of the uh, types of data and transformations that you can do with visualization. Um, sounds like, uh, by the show of hands, it seems like a lot of you guys have some experience with that already. So um, much of this may be review, but um, hopefully you know, you'll learn a few things along the way too. Um, and then talk about some different tools and, and data formats and that sort of thing. Um, and then at the near the end, I'll talk a little bit more about um, some tips for doing some things for production viz, um, and then also a little bit, development is maybe not the right word there, but um, uh, different uses for visualization besides just sort of the pretty pictures and, and you know, using it for publications, that sort of thing. Um, so a couple examples. Um, I guess the slide's a little dark, but um, so this is a project that I worked on that's uh, um, simulating blood flow uh, in the brain. And so there's a, they start with um, MRI data of a real patient um, of, the, of the arteries in their brain, and there's an aneurysm um, growing on one of these things. And so they're interested in and looking at how um, different uh, flow patterns within the, uh, within this overall structure uh, can impact particle behavior in, in a small subregion. And so it's an example of using, uh, doing multi-physics, multi-scale simulation. Um, so they use a, a, um, a fluid dynamics simulation uh, code for doing the overall flow structure. And then they couple that with a particle dynamics code for doing, um, looking at, at particles as they build up on the wall of this aneurysm. So, um, uh, just an example of, of a number of, of different types of visualization techniques used throughout that and, um, and coupling these different types of, of large-scale simulations together. Uh, another example, um, doing climate. Um, so in this case, they start with um, obser observed data and use that as the seed point for their simulation, for their they have a number of coupled models. What we're looking at in this view is uh, uh, total precipitable water. So essentially, um, the red regions is where there's high concentrations of, of uh, moisture in the atmosphere. Bluer regions where, is where there's lower concentrations of that. Um, at the time, this, this simulation is actually a couple years old now, but at the time, at least, it was uh, one of the largest resolutions uh, uh, simulations on a global scale. It was done on um, resolution of uh, an eighth of a degree in latitude and longitude. And so for doing that, uh, again, on a global scale, that was um, very high resolution. Um, and so they're looking for, um, as I said, they start with observed data and, and march their simulation forward, and then they go back and compare. And, and they're, not, they're looking for statistical correlations between you know, what they're computing and what was observed. So for example, um, you can see, see storms forming. Those don't necessarily match with specifically named storms that were observed, but um, statistically they expect to see the same types of um, activity um, at different points during the year. It's a simulation that ran for, um, it simulated 27 months of, of uh, calendar time, um, simulating on a, um, an hourly basis, so each time step was an hour in that calculation. So um, it ran for a really long, you know, a really long time, and they would be able to, you know, so basically two years worth of calendar time. So they would be able to go back and, and compare that with observed data to, to see if statistically they were getting the same types of um, uh, uh, phenomena. Uh, this is an example of. Um, working with industry. So this is from a, a team from General Electric Global Research that's looking at um, jet engine design 
um, and trying to figure out how to do uh, reduce, uh, reduce noise pollution, but in this, at, at the same time, by doing that reduction in, in turbulence and noise, it's also um, producing more efficient, uh, more fuel efficient uh, jet engines. Um, then just a couple quick examples of different types of material science and, and, and molecular. Uh, um, and so the, this one down here in the center is uh, um, data that was collected at the advanced photon source um, for uh, a protein um, that was reconstructed there. Uh, the other two are simulation data that were, that were generated at the, um, on different resources. One of them is older than the other, but uh, from e resources from the ALCF. Uh, and this is in a, um, also a very dark um, image, but an uh, example of a cosmology data set. This is um, from a team from Argonne that's looking at uh, dark matter simulation. And um, it's, it's a very large scale, 1.1 uh, trillion particle uh, dark matter simulation. What we're looking at here is actually um, a data from um, a single a single process from that simulation. Um, so the the full data set is actually about 60 times larger in each dimension. Um, and we have software that we've been working with them uh, to visualize their data. Um, and we have software that'll actually that that can visualize um, pretty much the full data set of, of that large data. All right, so quick, a little bit about um, resources. You've probably heard a little bit about Cooley already. I think you may have even run some stuff on there already, if I remember seeing on the mailing list correctly. But I'll tell you a little bit about it, because it's a new machine for us. Um, it just went production this summer. Um, it's a VIS analysis cluster uh, at Argonne. It's a 126 node cluster where each node has um, two multi-core processors and um, the latest uh, Tesla K80 graphics card in it. Um, and the one thing that's sort of a big deal for us, well, in addition to the high-end graphics cards, is that it has a lot of memory, 384 gigs per node um, on this machine. And so in total, that's about 47 terabytes, which um, compared to Tukey, which was our previous machine that um, we just retired right about the same time that this that we went production, um, it had about six terabytes of memory. So it was, in terms of memory, it was a huge upgrade for us. Um, we also doubled the amount of um, GPU memory per node. So we went from, um, actually maybe it's more than that. Um, but at any rate, it, we went from about a terabyte of of GPU memory to about three. Um, and, and then it also shares the same high-speed uh, high bandwidth uh, infrastructure that's, that's used on Mira. So uh, we do use it for doing some, um, at this point, not production, production work yet, but we're working towards that, of connecting uh, simulations that are running. And, and because it, it shares this high-speed bandwidth, uh, network, we're able to, to transfer data from the, the, the compute cluster to the visualization cluster um, very quickly and do some, um, some simulation time analysis and visualization. And so we're working towards um, making that more of a, um, right now it's, it's sort of a, uh, it's still sort of in the research field. We're not doing that on a daily basis. We're working towards, um, towards being able to do that. Uh, I'm, and the other, the main thing that's important to note about from this slide is that it shares a file system with, with uh, Mira and Cetus. So when you, save your, when you run your simulations on a large scale cluster, uh, supercomputer and write that data to disk, you can read it, uh, uh, read it into memory on the Viz cluster without need to move it around, um, which when you're looking at data at this scale um, tends to be pretty important. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of our majority of our users probably are not locally at Argonne, so um, it's not uh, usually um, the scale of the data is large enough that they're it's it's not typically um, practical 
or even sometimes possible to move the data to their local institution to do visit analysis. So um, we provide this cluster uh, that, that enables you to do that. So a little bit about um, visualization algorithms or transformations. So we sort of break these down into a um, couple of different categories. So we talk about structure. So when you're looking at, your, at, at the data, um, some transformations are geometric. So for example, for translating or rotating, scaling, um, scaling the data. Um, but in those cases, the topology just remains unchanged. So you're just um, doing some sort of transformation in terms of, again, sort of the connectivity between, if, for example, if it's a mesh, the connectivity between the cells does not change. You're just moving around the coordinates and, um, um, and, sc and scaling the variables associated with those. Um, but then there's other types where you're changing the attributes, where you're actually transforming um, the data to create new, new attributes. For example, if you have a, um, a velocity field and you're, and you're calculating streamlines through that field or um, uh, producing glyphs, and we'll talk about, some, we'll show some examples of both of those types of things in a little bit. Um, and then we also talk about type, where whether it's a scalar field where you're talking about a single value uh, per, per vertice of your, of your mesh or your point field. Um, vectors, where it's an array of values. Uh, tensor, where it's a matrix, or you may have some combination of all those things. So when we're looking at, um, at data at really large scale, um, we, we tend to do, because of a, the, our cluster is a distributed memory cluster, uh, the visualization cluster, that is, um, you have to do uh, data domain decomposition. And this is very similar to the way you probably maybe are familiar with how you would do this um, on the simulation side, but you need to do it similarly. You need to do the same thing on the visualization side. And so one way is if you have a regular grid where essentially every, every cell of the grid is regularly sized and spaced, um, and each one holds a, a single value per variable. Um, and you divide the subdomain, you subdivide this domain among all the processes. And so you evenly divide those up. Um, but then in addition, you need to consider ghost cells. So you have this extra row of cells between adjacent, um, uh, adjacent, uh, so for example, if each of these chunks of grid is on a different process, um, you need to have neighbor, a row of neighboring cells from the neighboring processes um, in order to do calculations. And of course, you need to do this between all of them. And um, you're probably familiar with this, but I'll explain in a little bit more detail why you might need, why you would need, why that's important to have these ghost cells. So if we have uh, this small grid here, and if we want to calculate, you know, or illustrate what's the the value, a continuous value across the line between these cells. All right, so if we want to do between those cells, um, basically we can just take these two and do a, a, a linear interpolation between each of these points, right? Um, but if we want to do something here, sure, you could, you would do the same thing, but if these happen to fall on different, uh, separate processes, When I'm, if I'm on this cell, I want to do the calculation to interpolate what's the value here. I don't know anything about this guy here. So this ends up being the same value as four and same on this side, right? So, and then when those two things are butt up against each other, there's an there's a inconsistency. Um, but so the way we handle that is by these ghost cells, if we add an extra row that we used for doing, um, doing our calculation, now, both of these sides know about each other. They can do this interpolation all the way to the edge. Um, and then when you butt those two up against each other, um, it has, it's seamless and you don't have uh, breaks. Uh, so another uh, decomposition is uh, adaptive uh, mesh refinement, so where you put more detail in regions that are changing more rapidly. 
right? And so this is going to help you save on both um, computational performance and on, and on uh, spa uh, storage space, both in memory and on disk. So for example, if we were to refine this at the highest resolution, it would take 64, um, 64 times the amount of computation and memory to store in this big region. But if we know for a fact, if we know a priori that this is, um, that the values are not changing over that spatial area, we can, we can save the storage and the computation by just representing that as, as one, um, one grid cell. And so here's a quick example, a 2D example looking at this. So this is uh, the surface of a star. And so you can see the top area is pretty much all the same. So you can have very few number of grid cells across the top. And then as we have a, uh, a detonation that happens in this lower corner here, and as the burning front moves across, it's a little hard to see here, but it's, there's some very fine detail in these regions here. So you can put much more detail um, in these smaller regions. It's a little easier to see here, all across here, where there's um, things are changing more rapidly. Uh, you can put a much higher level of detail um, in those places and much fewer uh, grid cells in the large regions that are changing more slowly. Um, now eventually, it may get to the point where you need to be um, highly refined everywhere, but at least early on in the calculation, um, you, can, you can save time and, and memory. Um, and again, that applies both for, you know, sort of organizing the data like this uh, affects both the simulation side and the visualization side as well. Uh, and this is just an example of, of how you might do some uh, domain decomposition for particle-based data. And there's a number of different ways of doing this in trade-offs that you have to consider. So for example, you could have, um, if, if we divide this by processes, and so you could have um, a different process keep track of a certain set of individual particles throughout the whole course of the simulation. Um, or you could have it be uh, based on the physical domain, right? So you could have um, one process that's responsible for this region, another one that's responsible for this region. But you can see they can quickly become out of balance, where you have many more particles here than you have here, and you end up having, um, in terms of compute time, um, you end up having one that's, that only has a few particles that to handle, and um, so it spends a lot of time waiting for the other guys to finish. So if my simulation is based on unstructured mesh, so how can I do this domain decomposition? Say that again? I mean, if my simulation is based on unstructured mesh. On so unstructured mesh? Yeah, how can I decompose my I mean, data? Well, so this is, this is specifically for a particle-based, how you would distribute particles among the different processes. Um, if you were to, if you had a, um, an unstructured mesh, you might have something similar to this where, where you would divide your mesh. It wouldn't be linear like this where you have all of the cells are the same size and shape, and, but you would, st you, you would look at how to divide those cells among different processes. Generally, you would try and make it such that you would have a, con a contiguous block of cells on each node. Right, so that um, as, you're, as you're calculating, you have to do less amount of, of communication between, between nodes because you want to you sort of minimize the, the computation cost, but also communication. Right? So you want to minimize the number of um, uh, the, the cells that, that, that you need to share between neighboring, um, uh, neighboring processes. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk um, some more about uh, some of the tools that are available. So there's all sorts of tools that can be used for doing visualization and analysis. Um, there's a number of visualization applications. Um, you'll hear more about a couple of those this morning, Visit and Paraview, um, which are open source tools. Uh, Insight is another. It's a, um, a uh, commercial package. 
um, but it, it does some of the similar things. Um, and these are more, the, the three of these are more end user tools, so they're sort of general purpose, um, and able to do a, a lots of, of different types of visualization on lots of different types of data. Um, and they're both very good at doing large scale, so they have uh, distributed memory architectures that enable you to do um, load, uh, load your data on a distributed resource, do your computation and visualization, and then attach um, a remote client in order to do interactions. So, th so they're largely GUI-based, um, but they do have, they also do have um, command line and, and API interfaces that enable you to do um, scripting and, and batch visualization and that sort of thing. Um, and you'll hear more about those this morning. Um, there's some other, uh, other packages that are more domain specific, like VMD, PyMall. Um, there's a couple of others that are sort of in that category um, that have, and I'll show some examples of, of this in a little bit, but um, they have, they have some, some types of visualization that are very specific to um, particular domains. Um, and, and again, I'll show some examples of that. Uh, and then there's different APIs, like VTK, the Visualization Toolkit, um, is a programming uh, interface for, for building applications. And in fact, Visit and Paraview are largely built on top of VTK. Um, and so you could use that to, to write extensions to, to Visit or Paraview or build your own applications. Um, ITK is uh, for doing segmentation and registration. There's a number of, of um, software that's, that's, that leverages the GPU for doing um, high performance visualization. VL3 is a shader-based volume rendering um, framework that, uh, that we've been building at Argonne and the University of Chicago. Um, Scout, actually I don't know if Scout is still around, um, but that was a GPGPU acceleration uh, framework. And then there's a number of frameworks, or, uh, uh, tools for doing different types of analysis, um, utilities for doing um, that are largely command line based, like a new plot image magic. I'll talk a little bit more about image magic at, uh, a little bit later. Um, and then some frameworks like VizTrails, which again, I'm not sure if VizTrails is, is still has legs under it, but um, it's, that's a framework for, for doing providence and, and, and building uh, workflows for doing visualization. So a little bit about um, Paraview and Visit versus VTK, I kind of mentioned this already. Those, they're, they're general person, uh, purpose uh, visualization applications. They're primarily GUI based, um, but they are both scriptable and extendable. Again, built largely on top of VTK, which is a, more of a programming environment. Um, it has, a, has more capabilities, gives you much, much finer control, um, but again, um, it's program, you know, it's, it's um, API based, so, um, so there's, a, there's a lot more um, programming involved in using those. It's, an, it's more of an API than just an end user tool, um, and it requires more expertise. Paraview and Visit, do you have any kind of comment about which one should someone pick in general? That's a very good question. Since there's representatives from both of them, it's a really loaded question. Um, Sorry. And <laughs> um, so the question was, do I have a recommendation for one or the other? And I would say not really. I think a lot of it is sort of personal preference in terms of they, they do all very similar things, a lot of it has to do with, at least from my perspective, a little bit of, about what the, interfa the GUI interface looks like. Um, there's, um, in some cases, uh, I think some of, the, um, some of it may depend on the simulation that you're doing in terms of if, if one of the big things I think is, is um, we end up doing a lot of data, what we call data wrangling of you know, so when you're doing your simulation, data is, is generally in a particular format that's, that's highly optimized for that simulation to work on the particular architecture that you're running on. And that's generally very different than the format you need to have it in 
to do visualization. Um, but depending on the code that you're using on the simulation side, they may have some preferred way of doing the data output. And so they may use formats that's, that are more closely coupled with one or the other of those visualization packages. Um, but yeah, I, I, I. If I'm used to one. If you're used to one. Or is it, there's no reason to switch over because of a certain niche that it does. Not that I've, that I would claim. I mean, I, I think, yeah, if you're used to one of them, I don't know that there's, at least that I'm aware of, there's not a huge advantage that one has over the other. In fact, there's a lot of work that's going on um, currently sort of at the lower level to look at. Um, so like I said, most of these are, they're largely built on top of VTK. And there's a new effort um, called VTKM for many core. And so they're looking at you know, how, how to build these, build them in such a way that they can run um, on, on large scale machines better, um, especially in the age of, of many core, multi core architectures. And so um, there's sort of this unified effort for building VTKM and getting and pushing that into both of those applications. So um, in that sense, I don't think there's a, there's a, a big divide between you know, choosing one over the other. I have been using one of them, uh, but I know that most of the capabilities, about 85 or 90 percent of the capabilities is the same. And why do you really have two softwares in almost the same thing? That's a political question, I think. Um, there's, I think that, you know, they, they sort of grew out of, out of um, different communities at, at the labs. I mean, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure how to, <laughs> how to really answer that question. <laughs> Say that again? Is there one solver library that everyone uses in the universe? Right, yeah, I mean, you could, yeah, re turn it around and say. But they're doing almost the same thing. Well, but there's lots of simulation codes that do almost the same thing as well, so. But you have a FNC, which is on the basis of all of them. But not everyone's gonna agree on everything all the time. <laughs> I think it's basically what it comes down to, right? I mean, a lot of it is, is you know, some of it is legacy, right? I mean, you know, these sort of grew out of different communities, and so um, I think different people, different, you know, disciplines and, and domains sort of gravitated towards you know, the one that was either geographically closest to them or, you know, that, that had, um, you know, aligned better with, with what they were doing. So, yeah, you're right. They do largely do the same thing. And so that's why I say it's hard to say, you know, how to choose one over the other. Um, so this is an example of, of, of different types of, of data file formats. Um, so this is by no means an exhaustive list, but um, just to give you an idea, there's lots of different data formats that the that both simulations and visualization um, packages uh, uh, can use. And so, if you can't find it, the the version the you know the data type that you use in this list, um, chances are there's a server there's a reader somewhere for your type of data or um, as I think I'll talk about in a slide or two, um, you can write your own. So, um, yeah, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so HDF5 is a you know, popular um, parallel data format that a lot of simulation codes use. And so one way of, of, of getting your data into some of these visualization packages is to use um, XDMF, which is a um, a lightweight XML wrapper around data. I mean, so it's, it's basically you know, a bunch of XML that describes the metadata about, about how your, um, your data is organized within the HDF data. Um, and then it just gives pointers into the, into the binary or HDF5 data. Um, you could convert uh, data, you could use the VTK format. Um, so you could either add some code to your simulation code that outputs it as, as VTK, or you can write some utilities to do some conversion. Um, you know, so you could read in your own, use your own routines to read in your data and then 
do a conversion to VTK and spit it back out to disk. Um, uh, there's also uh, C++ and Python bindings. Um, so as I mentioned, in terms of format, the existing tools support lots of different flavors. So you could either use one of those or um, use or write a format converter that already exists. Your question? Are any of the hands-on labs later this evening going to show us how to generate one of these data formats as an example? HDMI or any of the, any of the uh, I'm going to look to. standard ones that are um, I don't know that we've. The hardest part getting into uh, this crazy data format. There's a specific example where you could show us how to do that. That would be very, very helpful. Yeah. So I don't know that we specifically have that planned right now, but I'll look to, to Cyrus and Dan to see if they have any of that. I think there's another I.O. section as well for that tomorrow. I don't know if they'll cover that. Yeah, I don't know if they'll cover Viz stuff, though. A quick example where you could show us, and a quick example of how to generate one of these formats that would help me a lot. Then. I didn't raise my hand earlier because I'm an associate professor, so I'd like <laughs> to kind of show that to some of my students. <laughs> <laughs> right, so as you said, that's, that's often one of the, the biggest hurdles to doing visualization is getting data from your simulation format into um, one of these viz formats. Um, so one of the ways is to use or, or write your own uh, format converter um, or use a, an existing, uh, write a custom reader for an existing tool. As I mentioned, both Visit and PairView are extensible so you can, they have a modular sort of plug-in architecture so you can write your own readers and use them in those tools um, or you could write your own um, custom tool. Uh, a little bit about serial versus parallel or partitioned data. I mean, so there's some uh, trade-offs between using a single really large file versus using many small files. And usually, there's some sort of middle ground that's, um, that, that's generally best. Um, there's VTK data sets, uh, data types that support this, um, as well as some of the other formats. XDMF, again, for HDF5 enables you to do that, or you can write your own custom one. So in terms of performance trade-offs, uh, I'll give an example of, of a finding that, that I came across um, in working with, the, with some users. So there's um, the trade-offs between, uh, again, using a serial file, which is all the data lives in one big file, versus um, dividing it up, and, and the way that in particular, um, my experience was with Pearview, um, where all the serial files, if you have a serial file, all the data is read on the head node of, of the thing, of, the, of your instance of Pearview, and, and then that data is partitioned and distributed to the, to the remaining nodes, where then, at, after that point, everything is done in parallel, where each of the nodes has a different chunk of the data that it can work on. Um, and so, but if you have a, a, parallel, a parallel file where it's already partitioned uh, across the nodes, it's much faster to read it in. And um, um, the hardest part is often doing this partitioning. So for example, I had a serial, a big serial file that was an unstructured grid. And it was about a little under four gigabytes. And in order to read this, and the, the geometry was pretty complex. Um, and so to read it in on 64 processes and do this distribution, um, it took more than 15 minutes. After 15 minutes, I stopped counting. Um, the, the actual read part was pretty fast, but doing this partitioning and distributing um, was, was what was taking a lot of time. But so I took that same data set and, and did the partitioning myself, or actually I used um, Pairview to, to um, to read it in on, on 64 processes and then write it back out as partition data. Subsequently, when I tried to read it, it increased the data size because it had to do um, some of the, the ghost cell stuff that I was talking about. So that it, you know, there's a little bit of duplication in data um, by creating these partitions, but, but then it reduced the read time on the same 64 nodes to under a second. And so in the long run, it ended up saving us a lot of time. So every time I read the data in, um, it didn't take 15 minutes. It took a second. So that's one of, 
an argument for, for how um, doing um, this parallel partitioning of data um, can be a big advantage. Excuse me? Sure. Just for partitioning, why does it increase from 3.8 GB to 8.7 GB? That is like more than twice. Well, part of that has to do with um, the, VTK the VTK file format. Um, is, uh, it's a, um, that's what I'm looking for. It tends to bloat data a lot because it, it repeats a lot of the information in terms of, um, in terms of the mesh. So you, it does do some, when you partition it, you have some number of ghost cells between. That between. should be, not be <coughs> twice the size. I can't say how, why it's that big, but that was my experience. And secondly, if you're not on a parallel I.O. system, then the most of the time is taken in the reading, in the I.O. of the, of the file, in my experience, rather than. It, well, it, dep it, it depends. It single partition or 64 partition, it is the I.O. which is the bottleneck. So why does it speed up so much? In this case, I was actually running it on a parallel file system that had multiple processes that were each reading a different chunk. And, and actually, um, it was when I when I when I did this first part, the reading part actually only I don't I didn't do specific timings, but actually reading off the disk was was not the bottleneck. That the reading part actually went very quickly. It was the partition. You know, once it read the data in, determining how to partition it across the the 64 processes is what took the majority of the time. Question? If I'm running, for example, on Mira. Yes. Which has a lot more uh, compute notes than CPU How many files should I, uh, how many files should I output for better visualization? So the question was, um, if you're running on Mira and you have really large, make sure, let me know if I can capture your question, right? If you have a, a really large number of um, compute processes, how do you then write, what's the sort of the right balance of number of, fi number of note files to write out? Um, and that's going to depend, but largely um, one of our sort of rules of thumb is when we're doing I.O. And again, I think there's another, uh, there's a session specifically on I.O. later in the, in the week. Um, you do aggregate, aggregate, data aggregation on the I.O. nodes. So for each rack of Mira, there's, I think there's two I.O. nodes per rack, if I remember, if I have the numbers correct. Um, so you aggregate the the data per I.O. node, and then write from those I.O. nodes. So rather than every process writing data, um, you have a much, much smaller number of, data, of, of nodes actually doing the writing. Does that sort of address your question? Yes. Uh, like if one process is going to write all the data from the other process, from the other process then it might not have enough memory to accumulate all the data and write into the file. So like, if every process writes directly to its own file, then it would be a much smaller memory. It would be much smaller memory, but you have a much higher overhead of, if you have every process, if you have, so for example, if you're running on the full cluster, you have 387,000 file handles open on the file system. That's a huge bottleneck. Thank you. So a little bit about visual cues. This is, comes from a, a really good book called Data Points. Um, that talks about um, about visualization and and not just scientific visualization, but in general, sort of communicating um, data visually. And so, so they identified sort of nine different categories or or, or sort of um, areas where you where visually um, uh, you describe data. And so one is, one is position, so our eyes are really good at distinguishing positions from one another, different positions. Length, so how long a shape is. The angle of rotation, so how far something is rotated is something that our eyes are very good at perceiving. So that's a good characteristic for, um, for representing data. Uh, direction, um, a shape or an area, how much space something takes up in 2D or volume how much space it takes up in 3D, and then a couple of different attributes of color, saturation being one, and 
um, and the hue, which is generally referred to as the color. So I'm quick going to go through um, a number of different types of data representations. Um, and then I'm guessing that you'll see some examples of how to do some of these things. Um, maybe not all of them, but some of them for sure, um, using some of the, t using the tools that um, Dan and Cyrus are going to talk about a little bit later. Uh, so volume rendering um, is a way of representing data. And it's basically you, you represent every value in a volume um, by some color and transparency value. So for example, um, in our little mouse friend here, you can, you can take, um, I, if you, you can identify there's like regions of values. And so we, for example, in that it's, we're looking at density of that. So you can designate certain color ranges of, to represent particular ranges of values. So for example, I know that this yellow region is either bone or cartilage or something. Um, red is some, has a different density value that represents some tissue um, and whatnot. And so there's, um, that's a good way for sort of representing data. And I'll show a, a quick slide of what this looks like in terms of um, you know, how this procedure works. So basically you shoot, you have a volume, and you shoot a bunch of rays through that volume. You take samples along the ray um, at each point. And for each of those, you assign, this is a transfer function. So you assign some color value. And this white line represents um, the transparency. So values that are, that are very low are going to be blue. And because this line is low, they're going to be primarily transparent. And so you can see a little bit of blue kind of poking through in here. And then at the high end um, is where there's regions where it's uh, high values are red, and they have um, they're mostly uh, translucent, so they're opaque. So you can see there sort of how those, um, this, sort of how that process works. Um, glyphs are another example. So taking some um, 2D or 3D geometric uh, object to represent a data point. And then, um, so the location is dictated by the coordinate of that value of, uh, that you're trying to represent. And then um, there's, you use other graphical uh, entities to dictate the attributes of the data. So for example, in this one here, this is a cross section of, um, of a particle flow. And they're colored by their velocity. Uh, so the, the blue ones are, have a lower velocity. The orange ones in the center have a higher velocity. So you can see that um, this is actually a cross section of this sort of tube here. And so you can see where. Um, the, the, the particles around the outside have a much lower uh, velocity because they're um, colliding with the side of the tube. Friction's causing them to slow down. The, the ones in the center are you know, unaffected by that, so they're sort of just zipping right through. Um, another couple of examples of glyphs. So for example, just using squares um, and, and these different little Icons are the other, other examples of glyphs. So visiting Paraview are really good at this. Um, VTK, again, because those other toolkits are built on top of VTK, um, it's good, but it requires more effort if you're going to do it directly in VTK. Um, GNU plot is a command line tool for doing mostly uh, um, command line driven and script driven for doing um, different types of tables and this sort of thing. Um, so uh, contours or ISO lines or surface, if it's, a, if it's in 2D, it's an it's a ISO line. If it's a 3D, um, it's an ISO surface. And so it's for, used to represent um, a specific value in a field. So it's basically when it's a threshold where, um, where if you cross that, this line represents where it crosses um, from this is a particular value in that field. Um, and so like in these, this top and bottom example, in this top one, we're actually looking at a number of different um, ISO values. So each of those colors represents a different value in that field. Um, alternatively, this bottom one is looking at the ISO surface value is actually this, there's a single value 
um, for that surface, but then we're using it uh, a, a different variable from the data set to map onto that surface. So the color represents a different value, um, a different uh, uh, scalar field in, that, in, the, in the simulation. Uh, so cutting planes, um, pretty straightforward. Basically, you take a slice through the um, through a data set um, and use color to represent um, the scalar field that it, that you're cutting through. Again, uh, visit and pair view good at this. VMD, um, which is the molecular uh, visual um, molecular dynamics software, um, has some similar capabilities. Uh, streamlines. Uh, so this is where you have a vector field, and it, it, it requires connectivity through this through the field. So you have essentially a mesh that has um, a uh, has a vector field, and so you take seed points and you trace the the path that um, that this vector field would flow um, within a time step. Um, and again, VTK and pair view uh, visit all good at this. Um, Again, this one on the left comes from a, a blood flow simulation. Uh, the one on the right comes from um, a, I forget exactly what it is, but there's, there's basically um, uh, an explosion that happens that, uh, that, that forces um, this air bubble uh, to form and split, and you're seeing the path of, of the, the particles through there. Um, so molecular dynamics again. VMD is really good at this. There's a couple of uh, there's there's plenty of other um, sort of free uh, open source tools for doing molecular dynamics. And again, this is sort of a very uh, domain specific. There's, so there's a number of um, they have different types of representations like these arrows and some of these squiggly line things that that are uh, more specific to that particular data domain, uh, science domain. Um, uh, Visit and Pair View have um, limited support for that, and a lot of that has to do with, again, sort of the, the domain-specific things that you're trying to look at. Um, and uh, VTK, again, anything's possible if you try hard enough in terms of writing your own tools for doing it. Um, in the last couple of minutes I have left, I'll give a couple of examples of um, doing, some, doing some production visualization. There's a number of different tools that you can use, um, for example, for doing annotations. So if you have a bunch of images, um, what I tend to do is I'll um, generate a series of frames that are just the, the visualization part, and then if I want to add annotations to it, I do that in a separate step so that I can um, have more flexibility in terms of being able to use those, those rendered frames for something. Um, and so this example isn't meant to scare you. It's all kind of very dense there. But um, the point of it is just to sort of show that you can break this down. You can do, um, I'll show you at the end what all this looks, what the image this produces. But um, the first part was you know, take, a, take a couple of different images and put them into to one image. And then these next couple of lines are um, add some annotations to it. And so this is the result of that image. So um, the text here and these, um, uh, the annotation on this color bar was what those four little sections were, one for each of them. Um, and so again, this was done using Image Magic, um, just an example of, of some post processing tools that you can use. Uh, it's also good for doing scaling and fading. Um, so for example, I have an animation that shows, it's kind of dark, to, tough to see this, but where this section, um, I wrote some scripts to, to scale and fade that section in as part of a, an animation. Um, I don't have time to show it now, but I have it. Um, laying around somewhere I can show it this evening if we have time to look at that, if you're interested in seeing some of the things that, you're, that you can do with some of these tools. 
um, a little bit about movie creation. So if you want to generate an animation, um, visit it in Paraview can, if, uh, if you want to generate a movie, you can have it, have it save it out as an AVI, um, render out an animation for you. As I said, what I tend to do is have it spit out individual frames that I can then compile together. A particular tool you could recommend when it comes to data compression, if you want to quickly on the fly, sometimes you get too much data out, you want to kind of, when you want to create your publication, I, I mean, very simplistically spoken. Uh, is there a particular tool you can recommend where you can kind of do quick data compression to kind of get the image in the type of format you want? In terms of compression in terms of, of the data or the image? Uh, or like whatever is kind of the, let's say, most clever way of, or the most practical way of uh, dealing with the issue if you want to kind of create images for publication and things like that. Um, Especially thinking of, thinking of being in a small research group, you don't have three or four grad students and two postdocs who can do the job for you, but you're doing essentially everything by yourself with a bunch of undergrads. Kind of that type of thing. Um, not that I can recommend it in the next two minutes, but um, I'm, I would certainly be happy to talk with you after. Um, so yeah, so one of the things about, about movie creation, again, so I tend to, to make basically these stacks of movie uh, frames that I could then um, compile together in different ways. You have a quick question? Do you do that? Because sometimes when I use Visit and I make a movie, it seems like it starts slowing down and slowing down as I go. And then <laughs> is, is that why you make the frames? And why would my Visit be doing that? slowing down as it goes along, making the movie? So there's probably a, a, a number of different reasons why it might slow down. The way, the reason I tend to do it is because if I have the individual frames, then, then I have more control over what I'm going to do with them, right? So, so for example, in the, the previous one where you saw the, the, the four pictures, those were actually rendered, uh, that was, and it was actually rendered with um, uh, this VL3 volume rendering software I mentioned. Um, but I rendered each of those at a higher resolution as a separate movie, rendered all their frames, and then, so then I had them available so that I could have an animation that had just one of them, or I can combine them in different ways. So it allowed me to have more flexibility about how I combined those things together to make different end products, basically. Um, right, and so it, it was, it's more about flexibility, really, than, than how long it takes to render it in that particular case. Um, does that answer your question? The first part, why yeah. my visit make, gets slow and stops in the middle of making a movie? I'm going to direct you to Cyrus for that. Oh, or I can ask yeah, yeah. The yeah, I mean, there's, uh, there could be a million, a hundred different reasons for why that might be. Um, so again, because, like I said, so I, when I do some of these, um, animations, I tend to do them sort of in segments. Um, and one easy way to sort of take them all and combine them, um, well, is with, a, with FFmpeg as a um, image encoding. To, you can use that to generate, take individual frames and encode them into a, a, an animation. Um, but it tends to like them to be all in the same directory. And so because I tend to do these sort of in segments, um, what I'll do is I'll generate a script that creates a directory full of symbolic <coughs> links that essentially has all of them in order. So I don't have to have multiple copies of all this stuff. Um, I can just basically script a movie that says, like this bunch of frames, and then this bunch of frames, and then, oh, I want to fade this out, so do that. And, and essentially have directories full of different frames, and then create one, one big directory full of symbolic links that point to these other frames. Um, just makes it easier to, to do this sort of combination. So I'm a little bit over time, so I'm going to go quick here. There's a couple of examples of, um, in addition to using visualization sort of as, as your end product for doing, um, you know, for, for doing publications or whatnot, um, there's a number of different other reasons why you might use visualization. So for example, for verification. So this is an example of, um, the blood flow stuff I was showing before, where we're coupling two different um, computations together. And so this is a cross-section at the top of 
through this aneurysm, and here's a, that's a small subregion. And so, in this case, um, the region outside this square was generated by one of the codes, and the region inside was generated by the other. And so, this is a sectional, essentially, you know, cut planes between those two domains at the intersection. And so, it's, it's a way of verifying that the, um, I mean, you're going to want to do some statistical analysis to make sure you're getting the same answers too, but um, this is a way to quickly sort of give some, some validation to the, that you have, use visualization to, to, to verify that your data is correct. Would, you be, would we be doing some examples like this later? Um, so I don't know if we'll be doing the verification part of it, but, but certainly we'll be doing different um, visualizations that do like glyphs and cut points and that kind of stuff. Um, this is an example of, um, of using visualization for debugging. So this was, uh, um, I worked with a team that was doing this uh, propeller. So these are two different propellers that are rotating in opposite directions. And they weren't getting the, and this is just showing the propeller part, um, but they weren't getting the results they were expecting and they couldn't figure out why. And so I visualized the, propellers for them, and if you watch this one on the right, as it simulates, right, so they had some bug in their code that was not reinitializing, and so as it went on, one of the propellers disappeared, so <laughs> obviously the effect was much different than they were expecting, so by using visualization, we were able to identify that, oh, that's not right, um, and so this is, this is the data that they were expecting to see after they fixed the problem. You can kind of still see the propellers are sort of underneath, underneath the, those surfaces. Um, and so they were looking for these, these, um, these vortices structures. Um, and then one, one last example I'll give um, for doing, using visualization as a diagnostic tool. So in this case, um, we were looking at, um, we were doing our volume rendering code, and this is again sort of that density field that, that we looked at before. And so, but we were trying to understand, we were threading the code to, to make use of parallelism, and we wanted to understand what process was, or what thread was responsible for doing which part of the work. So instead of coloring them, each of the, um, uh, each of these data values by the data in their, in the, that was calculated, we instead said change it and just show me the color based on the thread ID. And so by rearranging different, different ways we were doing the, the parallelization, um, this is an example of coloring it by the, the thread ID rather than the actual data value. Um, and so you can see that you get, you get very different results and, and so this was a way for us to investigate sort of how we were arranging our data and how we were doing our computation, um, but representing it in a visual form that helped us sort of get a better understanding of what the code was doing. And so with that, where I'll wrap up, um, you know, I have, have these references for um, where to get some more information. The user guide for Cooley, our, our cluster at ALCF, um, Visit and pair of you uh, links and another for image magic. So with that, I think 